We're now going to look at non-standard problems. What are they and how do you solve them? Standard linear programming problems all had the characteristic that when you have a standard problem, think about uh, two-dimensional problems and the solution region that we obtained graphically back in part two. With a standard problem, the origin where the x and y axes intersect is always in the solution region. And in effect, what the, what the simplex method does for you with a standard problem is it starts you at that corner point, and then each step that you take in implementing the simplex method moves you from whichever corner point you're at to an adjacent corner point until you eventually arrive at the optimal corner point. A fundamental difference between a standard problem and a non-standard problem is that with non-standard problems, you're not even in the solution region to start out with. So you have to do some preliminary work even to maneuver your way into the solution region. Now an observation that I want you to make before we start relates to what you're looking at here. The blue box contains four numbers and the yellow box contains the negative of those four numbers. What's the largest number in the blue box? It's 14. The most negative number in the yellow box is minus 14. Or to put it another way, the biggest number in the sense of farthest to the right on the number line in the left box is 14 the smallest number in the sense of farthest to the left on the number line is minus 14 in the yellow box. If you want to know the largest value in the blue box, you can get it by taking the most negative value in the yellow box and changing its sign, or vice versa. If you wanted to know the smallest value in the yellow box, you could get it by finding the largest value in the blue box and changing its sign. We're going to come back to that idea shortly. We'll return to the bicycle factory example where we have the bicycle factory that produces uh, three-speed and ten-speed bicycles. We saw this problem when we were solving program, pro, uh, problems graphically. Uh, we set it up with X being the number of days to run factory A and Y the number of days to run factory B and our constraints when we did the problem graphically were as shown here. You have to make at least 96 three-speed bikes, at least 140 ten-speed bikes. So the production of three speeds at factory A plus the production of, free, of three speeds at factory B has to be at least 96. Production of three speeds at factory B plus production of ten speeds at factory B has to be at least 100, uh, 140 because we have those two orders that have to be met and the minimize the cost which we're minimizing is as shown here so this is the problem which we're simply carrying over from part two of the course uh, we did solve this problem geometrically back then when we solved it geometrically what we found was that the optimal solution was to run factory A for three days factory B for four days and the net cost would be 6200, the smallest cost associated with any of the corner points of the solution region. The solution region is the region out here, and the corner points were here, here, and here. Okay, so let's come back and start thinking about how we're going to approach this problem using the simplex method. The first thing we're going to do is to rewrite the problem rather dramatically. We're going to take each of the constraints which is a greater than or equal to constraint and multiply that inequality by minus one which will reverse the direction of the inequality. So the first inequality because it's a greater than or equal constraint we multiply through it by minus one and write it like this. Similarly with the second constraint it gets multiplied by minus 1 so that it looks like this. 
Remember that with standard problems, we did not have greater than or equal to constraints. One of the requirements in a standard problem is that the constraint be less than or equal to. With non-standard problems, where we have greater than or equal to type constraints, we force them to be less than or equal to type constraints by multiplying them by minus 1, which reverses the direction. Now we're also going to tamper with the cost function which we're minimizing. We're going to change it into a maximizing problem. Instead of minimizing the cost, we're going to replace the cost by its negative. Let's let D equal minus C, which would be minus 1000 minus 800Y. Instead of minimizing C, we're going to maximize D. Going back to that little trick that we looked at with the blue box and the yellow box, if we can maximize D, then in the end, we'll know what the minimum value for C is by just taking the maximum value for D and changing its sign. So we've started out by rewriting the two inequalities in this way, since they were greater than or equal constra to constraints to start with. We replace the cost function we're minimizing by x negative and recognize that we're going to have to maximize that. These are the constraints, after we've rewritten them in this way, to which we introduce the slack variables. So for these two constraints, we introduce slack variables u and v. And then the equation for d, d is minus 1000x minus 800y. When we bring those terms over, this equation for d becomes 1000x plus 800y plus d equals 0. So it's after we've made those modifications, and we have this, that we write down our initial simplex tableau, and these are the equations that go into the initial simplex tableau. The initial tableau will have an x column, a y column, a u column, and a v column for our slack variables. A d column, we're replacing the cost by its negative, which is d. So the initial simplex tableau is the augmented matrix for this system of equations. Now, of course, one thing that's different you notice to start with is we don't even have any negative numbers in this bottom row. With a standard problem, we start the process by grabbing the most negative number from that bottom row to find out where our first pivot element will be. Here, we don't even have any negatives down there when we start. But what's new is we have negatives over here on the right, which we did not have with a standard problem. So the process is going to work differently from the very start. With non-standard problems, Frequently, you will not have any negative numbers in the bottom row to start with. But you will have negative numbers over here on the far right. Uh, and that, that makes a difference. Even if you did have a negative number in the bottom row, but had negatives over here as well, you don't do anything with that negative number in the bottom row, but rather look for your negatives over here on the far right, which tell you how to start the process. To find the first pivot element, here's what we do. Come over here and grab any negative number in this far right column. Don't worry about the bottom position. You're never going to be looking in the bottom position down here. It will always be above the bottom position. You've got two negative numbers that you see in that far right column above the bottom spot. So just pick any one of those to get started. Let's pick the minus 96, for example. Slide to the left until we arrive at some column where there's a negative number. Now, if I'm focusing on the minus 96, where are the places directly to the left of that where I see a negative number? I see it in column 1 and also in column 2. Those are the places where I have a negative number in the same row as the minus 96. So I simply slide over and arbitrarily pick one of those two negative numbers as my starting point, and what that means is I can arbitrarily pick column 1 or column 2 as the column from which my first pivot element will come. I can look anywhere to the left of the minus 96 
where I find a negative number and use that as my pivot column. Now the rule for picking the pivot element is not changed very much. Once I have decided which column I'm working with, I still do the ratio game, minus 12 into minus 96 and minus 20 into minus 140. Only now I'm allowed to use negative numbers provided I get a positive ratio. Minus 12 into minus 96 will give a positive number. So that's a positive ratio, 8 in that case. Minus 20 into minus 40 also gives me a positive ratio, 7. So what I'm looking for is the smallest positive ratio. And since 7 is smaller than 8, that determines the minus 20 as my first pivot element. Minus 96 over minus 12 is 8. Minus 140 over minus 20 is 7. 20 wins the contest to be the pivot element. So this was all based on the decision to use the second column as my pivot column. I could have looked at the minus 16 and chosen a pivot column from column 1, but that's not what we're doing right now. Once the pivot element has been chosen, the procedure to operate on that column is the same as before. We want to make that a 1 and the other numbers in that column a 0. So our first row operation will be minus 1 20th times row 2, which will take us to this step, to this point. And then I will do what? I will do row 1 plus 12 row 2, row and row 3 minus 800 row 2 as my two row operations to make the minus 12 and the 800 into zeros. And when that's been done, this is the tableau that I wind up with. So this is where I am after having done the first step in the simplex method attempting to solve this non-standard problem. The thing to notice at this point is that we still have a negative number in this spot in the far right column above the bottom spot. So the next pivot element can be, I don't have any choice now about where to start uh, among the two spots in the, in the far right column which are above the bottom spot. Here's the only negative number that I find in, over here among these two. So I have to look here, and then when I look to the left of the minus 12, I see this minus 4 and this minus 3 fifths as the two negative numbers that lie to the left. So that signals to me that I could use either the X column or the V column as my next pivot column. So let's just uh, arbitrarily pick one of those. Let's pick the first column as our next pivot column. and I'm making that choice simply because the numbers in column 1 look a little easier to work with than the numbers in column 4. So if we're going to use the first column as our next pivot column, uh, what are the ratios we check? Minus 4 into minus 12 is 3, 1 into 7 is 7. Both of those are positive ratios. 3 is smaller than 7, so the minus 4 which gave us the ratio of 3, will be our next pivot element. In order to carry out this next step, I'll make the minus 4 into a 1 by multiplying row 1 times minus 1 fourth, which takes me to this tableau, a new row 1. And then I will need to do row 2 minus row 1 and row 3 minus 200 row 1 in order to get zeros in these two spots. And when that's all done, I'm looking at the tableau right here. Now, the first thing I want to check is that I have eliminated the negatives in these two spots. Once that's done, then the solution process reverts to the same as it was for a standard problem. I come over here and look for negatives down here. Again, ignore the bottom right-hand corner. I don't have any negatives down there either. If I did have negatives down here, I would continue to work on the problem the same way as if it had been a standard problem. 
but I don't, so that signals to me that I have finished the problem, there's nothing else to do, and I have found the optimal solution. So again, the order in which you check things, first check to make sure there are no more negative numbers left in these two spots. Then check if there are negatives left down here. And when you don't have any negatives in either place, you're finished. And it's simply a matter of interpreting your tableau to see what the optimal solution is. The U column and the V column are the ones which are not in the basic unit form. So U and V would be 0. X would be 3. Y would be 4. And D would be the maximum value of D is minus 6 to 200. So we can simply change the sign and conclude that the minimum value of C would be plus 6 to 200. That is, the optimal solution would be to run factory A for three days, factory B for four days, at a cost of six to two hundred dollars, which of course does agree with what we found when we solved the problem graphically. Let's backtrack a bit to see what would have happened if we had made some different decisions in the process. After the very first step, when we were ready to begin the second step, we were looking at the minus 12 in this spot, and we were allowed to choose which negative number to the left of that we wanted to use to determine our next pivot column. I chose to look at the minus 4 and to pick my pivot element from column 1. Let's see what would have happened differently if we had focused on this minus 3 fifths and chosen our pivot element from the V column. In the V column, if we're picking our pivot element from that column, we have to check minus 3 fifths into minus 12 and minus 1 20th into 7. Well, actually, here we're dividing a negative number into a positive number, which is going to give us a negative number. Remember, we're looking for smallest positive ratio. So, in fact, we don't really even have to do the division to know which the pivot element is because minus 3 fifths into minus 12 is the only one of these that will even give us a positive ratio. So the minus 3 fifths sort of wins the contest by default to be the next pivot element. To do the pivoting, we need to multiply that first row by uh, minus 5 thirds to make that into a 1. And then we need to do... Uh, the two, the two row operations to make these two spots into zeros, so that would be what? It would be row 2 plus 1 20th row 1 and row 3 minus 40 row 1. When we did those two row operations, uh, we would be finished converting the V column to its basic form that we want. And notice that had we done that, it would have succeeded in clearing the negatives from these spots in the far right column, but notice that it's dumped a negative number down here in the bottom row for us. So we're not yet done. We now have to continue just like we did with standard problems and take that negative number, which is of course the most negative number in the bottom row, and choose a pivot element from the column just as we did for standard, pro standard problems. So we would, we would be looking at 20 thirds divided into 20 and 4 thirds divided into 8. When we did that we would find that 20 thirds into 20 gives us the smaller ratio so we would have to pivot making that a 1 and these other two guys zeros and the multiplication that makes that first row a 1, the result of that is shown here. Do the two row operations to make these other spots equal to zeros, and you wind up with what's shown here. So it took an extra step when we followed this alternate route, but after that extra step, notice we have arrived at no negatives over here, and also no negatives on the bottom. And now when we interpret the tableau, uh, U and V get set equal to zero just as before, and X is three, Y is four, and D is minus six to two hundred just as before, giving us a minimum cost of six to two hundred. 
So we do arrive at the same optimal solution. However, it did take one extra step if we followed that alternate route through the simplex method. So I, I do that illustration simply to point out to you that when you're, when you're making your choices of pivot columns uh, with non-standard problems, you don't have any way of knowing which is going to get you to the solution most rapidly, but the reassurance you have is that you'll get there eventually no matter which choice you make.